Through the Gate, your paranormal portal podcast, as we delve into the many questions and wonders brought on by the supernatural experience. What's on the other side of the gate? Let's find out together. find out. Marilyn's romantic links to President Kennedy and his brother Robert Kennedy, the reason she died. Was her death the result of an accidental overdose of sleeping pills or a deliberate premeditated conspiracy to keep her quiet? Over the years, these and other questions have puzzled investigators. I did not think that she was ready to kill herself. No, I did not. I just think that it was not suicide. I do not think Mark Marilyn committed suicide. Marilyn Monroe did not commit suicide. She was murdered. She was a uh, girl that knew too much and she ended up dead one morning. John Kennedy has other worries. The situation in Cuba is increasingly critical. The Cold War with Khrushchev is at its height and the Berlin Wall splits Germany in two. The Russians win the first leg of the space race with Gagarin, but the U.S. soon responds with Shepard. In Nevada, nuclear testing goes on unabated as the fear of nuclear war grips the whole world. In this tense climate, FBI boss J. Edgar Hoover believes the president is taking unnecessary risks. He advises Kennedy to keep a distance from his mistresses, and the order is given to put a stop to the pillow talk. We now know that from a quite early date in 1962, J. Edgar Hoover was taking an interest in what the Kennedys were doing with Marilyn Monroe. As I approached Olympic Boulevard, I spotted a Lincoln Continental doing about 70 miles an hour eastbound on Olympic Boulevard in a 25 mile zone. I threw on my red light and siren and finally got the car stopped right here at the curb, uh, which is a mile away. I walked up to the car, recognized Peter Lawford, whom I'd known for years, uh, driving. Uh, seated in the back seat was Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, and there was another man in the front seat with Peter Lawford. I asked uh, uh, Peter why he was driving so fast. He said he was trying to get the Attorney General to the Hilton Hotel to get up and pick up his luggage. He had to leave town. Uh, and I said, well, Peter, you're two miles beyond the turnoff point for the Hilton Hotel. And at that time, the Attorney General said, you stupid ass, referring to Peter Law. Well, over a period of time, I was not at all surprised that the Kennedys were a very important part of Marilyn's life. And uh, so that I was just a, I wasn't included in this information, but I was a witness to what was happening. And you believe that he was here? 
Did you at Marilyn's house? Yes. Oh, sure. That afternoon? Yes. And you think that is the reason that she was so upset? Yes, and it became so sticky that the protectors of Robert Kennedy, you know, had to step in there and protect him. Welcome, Here. listeners. My friend, Mark Shaw, everybody. Welcome in, Mark. Oh, thank you. That was uh, wonderful, that uh, introduction. I've got tears, <laughs> and I made the thing. So it, it's so, um, it's still on the surface, Mark, and I think you know why. Because um, we hunger for the truth, like Dorothy Kilgallen. We hunger for justice. Um, we want to believe that most people are good and decent, and it just doesn't turn out that way, does it, Mark? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't because uh, we don't know exactly what's being hidden at times, but uh, so many people are afraid of the truth. And especially when it, when it involves, uh, you know, a prominent people like Dorothy Kilgallen or uh, Marilyn Monroe, two remarkable women. I get, I get very passionate about this, and I've done so when I write my books, the last two, especially uh, two or three. Uh, about Dorothy and her life and times and her death, and then Marilyn and her life and times and her death, because these were two remarkable women, and they should have never died, as is the case with JFK. And so uh, that's one of the reasons that I'm proud of the new book, a breakthrough book called Collateral Damage. And it's right here. I highly recommend it, as I do all of Mark's books. And just for another little small introduction, there is a wonderful conversation we had uh, when the reporter who knew too much and uh, Denial of Justice came out. And we did an in-depth uh, talk on Dorothy and uh, her integrity and the kind of journalist that she was um, to the point of she said she would rather die than give up her sources. She always went after the truth and you and i had a discussion after that about um what she thought about uh marilyn's uh death and i think that's where you kind of started when you found out that they knew each other a little do you want to talk a little bit about that or anywhere you want to start no that's fine i think you were one of the first people that, that talked to me when when we had our interview about connections between Marilyn and Dorothy, their life and times and their deaths and everything. But frankly, I was dubious of that. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, I had written a book about Melvin Belli, the uh, lawyer for Jack Ruby and proven his affection with the mafia and all that kind of thing. Then the Poison Patriarch, which was about the 60 election being fixed by Joe Kennedy and the Kennedy. So, so Jack Kennedy would win. And the fact that he'd made a deal with the devil, with those uh, gangsters, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that if they helped win the election, they'd leave them alone. And then Bobby went after them. We can get into that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the reporter who knew too much, which became a bestseller, which went into uh, all the facts and circumstances about Dorothy Kilgallen, who I did not know very much about, other than her being a star on What's My Line. And we should talk about that a little bit to update some of your listeners. But she was this uh, remarkable woman, one of the greatest journalists who ever lived a true woman of integrity. Uh, she, was, uh, she was different than most of the reporters today because she actually went out and found the facts before yes. she provi provided conclusions instead of the other way around. But she was best known for What's My Line, the uh, CBS uh, television show. They guessed unusual occupations every Sunday night at 10 o'clock. It was watched by about 10 million people. She had a, a radio program with her husband, uh, Richard Comer, that called B Breakfast with Dorothy and Dick, listened to by a million people a day in New York. Uh, she uh, had a syndicated newspaper column called Voice of Broadway that covered uh, Hollywood gossip, but also true crime and all of that. 200 newspapers across the country syndicated that. And then through Dorothy, I learned about her investigation of the JFK assassination. And 18-month uh, investigation, JFK was a pal of hers, a friend. And she went after that... Uh, that, it, you know, that death of his, uh, like she did with every case that she ever covered. And uh, as of the end of uh, 1965 came along, uh, she was writing a book for Random House. She was going to go ahead and uh, expose those people who were involved in JFK's assassination, as well as the cover up by 
J. Edgar Hoover when she was found dead uh, in her apartment in New York City. As you know, uh, I investigated that death and proved that it was not an overdose of drugs, but murder. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I've gone ahead and uh, tried at least to get a reinvestigation of that death. So I pretty well had covered all of that. I'd also exposed the Jack Ruby trial transcripts, which are the most important JFK assassination documents in history. And so very frankly, you know, that was enough. Yes. But people like <laughs> people like you and readers around the world of my books kept saying, is there a connection between the life and times and, and, and the death of Marilyn Monroe and Dorothy Kilgallen? Well, at first I didn't think so because uh, you have to remember that these three people, the subject of collateral damage, died within 40 months of each other. Yes. Uh, Marilyn, August of 1962. In fact, her, the anniversary of her death is next Tuesday, August 4th of oh, 62. Wow. Uh, then we had uh, JFK in November of 63 and Dorothy in 65. So there actually were three years plus uh, uh, between the deaths of Marilyn and, uh, and uh, Dorothy. And so I thought, well, come on now, you know, there's really nothing here to look into. But because of your uh, insistence and other, I started looking in. And the first thing I found is a photograph of Marilyn and Dorothy uh, on the set of a movie uh, that was being made at 20th Century Fox in uh, 1961, 62, right in that early area there before she died. And they're standing together looking at each other. They were friends. I found out that uh, Marilyn had been to Dorothy's home in, in, um, in New York City and been to parties there and all of that. And then there was this this column that I came across, and it was it was really important to me, and it kind of set up everything and made me go forward. And basically, uh, it's a, a bit of a sad uh, story in some ways, this column, because it talks about, it says, Marilyn, the golden girl, loses third marriage pursuing love. And basically what she did is she recounted the fact that Marilyn had had three marriages, the right. first was a childhood marriage to a, to a friend of hers she met in high school. Then it was uh, Joe DiMaggio, the great baseball player for the Yankees, Hall of Famer. And then it was Arthur Miller, the noted playwright. And so what did Marilyn wrote? Well, she wrote in this column, and I'll just read just a little bit of it. Picture an, picture an orphan girl who has never had a dime. Now, this goes back to Marilyn uh, having a terribly tragic childhood. Mother had mental institution, had mental problems. She was carted around from, from a family to family, foster family, and all of that. So her upbringing, uh, there was never any money in it. So Dorothy wrote, picture an orphan girl who's never had a dime. Someone leads her into a toy store and says, you can have anything you want. She chooses one toy after another. But while the toys are being wrapped, she finds it hard to believe that the toys are really here. That's Marilyn Monroe. It's a short version, but the most famous of all blondes today is facing her third divorce because she was, in truth, an orphan girl suddenly let loose in the biggest toy store of all the world. She could have had anything she wanted because she was fabulously beautiful and appealing, and inevitably some toys were men. And then she talks about the three marriages that she had. And then she, uh, Dorothy wrote, sad for sure, but as we shall learn, there are two new toys on the way, but one of them was very deadly. And so it then says that, you know, unfortunately, wow. when Marilyn was in the world uh, again, without any love, she was going to pursue love again. But unfortunately, as we know, just about a year after this column was, uh, was uh, released, uh, she fell into the wrong kind of love. And we can get into that because it goes ahead and it basically uh, leads to the death that she had in 1962. Absolutely. And, you know, for just to add to that, if I may, um, as somebody who was basically an orphan at 12, um, you ha that was me. So I could kind of see into that life a little bit and I can understand um, a little bit more where Marilyn was coming from. There was, of sure. course, rumors and innuendo that in the foster family, she went through abuse and uh, we'll never know how deep that was. Um, she, but she alluded to it in her poetry and when she spoke. And if you listen to her interview, most of the time she's basically she wants to be taken seriously um you have to understand listeners that she was a much better actress than anybody gives her credit for she always played the dumb blonde but the best um the best part that marilyn ever pulled off was marilyn 
She mm -hmm. would go through this change. You put the makeup on and she kind of almost like a Native American putting on war paint. She was preparing her mind and her walk and her body and the way she moved her mouth and the way she spoke yeah. because she found she found a way to make it work. She okay. found that that would get her where the parts that would get her, you know, a little further and it would, um, but she was never stopped looking for an honest heart that loved her back for Norma Jean. I'm only stopping you there for a minute because you will like this quote that was in the book. I think maybe uh, you remember it, but I interviewed a woman, uh, Kara Williams, who was a, um, uh, Academy Award nominated actress. And she knew, and I really try to find primary sources, people who knew Marilyn or anything written about her just uh, close to when she uh, died and all of that, so that I'm giving the reader uh, really the most authentic information. And so uh, through a friend down in LA who sends me all these uh, photographs, he's a, he's a terrific uh, Broadway producer. Uh, he told me about Kara Williams and she was, a, as I say, an Academy Award uh, uh, nominated actress, and I got in touch with her. She was 94 years old, oh. and she recalled uh, working with Marilyn on a couple films, and one of them she talked about the fact that Marilyn, uh, when they would come into the dressing room there, she would see Marilyn in front of the mirror, and the uh, those that were trying to put makeup on her and everything else like that, she would try to transfer her into a different version of Marilyn, depending on what kind of makeup and so on and so forth and the hairstyle and all that kind of thing. So she was very cognizant, you know, of, of who she was and, and everything. I would just differ a little bit with you in terms of the dumb blonde uh, roles she played because those were er early on uh, more than anything. If you look at the Asphalt sure. Jungle, for instance, there's one, that's one film where she was more serious. But toward the end, I, I really encourage people to watch The Misfits with Clark so Gable. Good and all of that. And and that's the serious actress in Marilyn, uh, Marilyn Monroe, because one of the things besides finding love in her life that she wanted so much was to uh, be considered a serious actress. Mm -hmm. And and she really studied that and all that. Also, you know, this whole, uh, this whole idea that she was a dumb blonde and stupid and all that. Well, well it's just completely false. This is what it bothers is. me and got me upset as I was working on the book because there's all those distortions of history about the JFK assassination, about uh, Dorothy for sure, but also Marilyn. Uh, all you have to do, I suggest that people get a book called Fragments that was written, um, uh, that, that has more, uh, Marilyn's poetry in there. Mm -hmm. It has her writings on the backs of, uh, of a stationery and hotel rooms and everything. And the example that I use um, <laughs> is, is the fact, you think, uh, Adam Blonde, well, she read Ulysses. Yes. And, and I tried to read Ulysses and I couldn't get beyond the second page. So mm -hmm. she wasn't what she appeared that way. I think to get ahead, she had to be that kind of dumb blonde and the, mm -hmm. and the blonde hair and the Marilyn and all that kind of thing. But as, as she was coming up on the time when she unfortunately died in August of 62, she was getting a much better reputation as a serious actress. In fact, she at one point, and we'll talk about why, was so suspect of her having supposedly committed what they called probable suicide because she was really on the upswing just before she died. Yes. And that's a big misnomer that's out there. Um, because I believe that she was offered, um, quite a few things that she was looking forward to. I, I, you know, I'd heard like, you know, possibly something on Broadway and, right. you know, other, other things. And everybody likes to say she lost everything because something's got to give. And everybody keeps playing the something's got to give with uh, Dean Martin and, um, you know, how she wasn't showing up and all these things were going on. But you have to understand what was going on with her at this time. And I think that you're going to, to let us know a little bit about what was going on and that's the whole reason for the intro and everything else there was so much going on in the world at that time mm -hmm. and i wanted to give uh, little snippets mm -hmm. of you know what kind of secrets you know we all hear about pillow talk mm -hmm. well if you know um a little bit more about the kennedys um gosh you don't have to know anything about kennedys you just have to get into that mind man mindset that's trying to impress 
a beautiful woman and that power, they flaunt power, they flaunt knowledge. They, you know, I've got a secret. Do you want to know, you know, that kind of stuff. And the Kennedys, I'm sorry, people, you know, but the Kennedys were that way from Joe on down. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, in the uh, Poison Patriarch that Mark also explains, you know, they used to laugh. Uh, the mob used to laugh and say, he's a bigger gangster than we are. That's right. That's right. That's right. And, you know, it's it's interesting, if I may just give um, sure. your, 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 uh, your, your audience an idea of how this kind of came about, because as sure. I said, um, the collateral damage, I was not going to write this book. And uh, I did, and also it has the longest subtitle of any book I've ever uh, written, uh, The Mysterious Deaths of Marilyn Monroe and Dorothy Kilgallen and the Ties That Bind Them to Bobby Kennedy and the JFK Assassination. Well, how did I get to that sort of a conclusion? Well, it began because I found uh, it very suspicious that Marilyn Monroe, and you were right on there, that's why I, I enjoy talking to you because you're so well prepared. Thank you. Uh, you're, you're dead on right. Uh, Marilyn had so much going for her right before she died, including a dream of hers, which was to appear on Broadway. But let's go back just a little bit, because, again, it was Dorothy Kilgallen who has been my guiding spirit, as you know. Um, you know some people say that I'm crazy, but I believe she chose me to write her story. And then she chose me to go ahead and look into Marilyn's death. And the, and the column that I found was um, quite fascinating because... Uh, it, it led me down the road of really uh, investigating as a historian what happened to Marilyn. It's called Marilyn Monroe Has Hollywood Talking Again. And basically what she wrote was, Marilyn's health must be improving. She's attending select parties and has become the talk of the town again. Mm -hmm. And she's cooking in the sexual appeal department too. Mm -hmm. She's proved vastly alluring to a handsome gentleman who is bigger than Joe DiMaggio in his heyday. So don't write off Marilyn as finished. Now that was two days before Marilyn Monroe died. And so Dorothy had looked into her friend and found out these were the things that were going on. So I thought to myself, wait a minute, that does not sound like a woman who would have committed suicide. So the first thing that, that I did, and, and this is what amazes me, that uh, other researchers uh, didn't go through the same journey. Now I did it kind of ass backwards because I looked at uh, JFK then Dorothy, then Marilyn. But that, that proved to be fruitful because it put Marilyn's death in context of the other two. But what I did is I, I did what I think any researcher should do. I went to the, the, the cause of deaths. Yes. The first thing I found was the, uh, the autopsy, and it said uh, at 10.30 a.m. on August 5th, the next morning, she died of an overdose of drugs. All right? No mention of suicide. By three o'clock in the afternoon, the certificate of death, probable suicide. Well, that made me very curious as to why that changed like that. But I thought to myself, something's wrong there. And so I again thought to myself, well, let's, let's t take a look at this and think to ourselves, if Marilyn Monroe was murdered, who, ha who could have possibly been responsible? Who would have wanted to, to quiet her, to silence her, to, to kill this remarkable woman uh, at age 36 and everything. So I went back to that column by Dorothy, God love her, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I'm not the best investigative reporter that ever lived, but she was. So I go back to that, and here's what got me. She's proved vastly a learning to a handsome gentleman who is bigger than Joe DiMaggio in his heyday. Well, Joe DiMaggio was a huge name it's at the time. Pretty big. Pretty who can big. That be? Who can that be? So I went back, and I found <laughs> that photograph that you had in the introduction uh, that was taken uh, just after Marilyn had sung happy birthday to JFK on his 45th birthday at Madison Square Garden in New York City. And it's a photograph taken at, uh, at a party afterwards. You have Bobby Kennedy with his back over here. You have JFK with his back over here. And here's mm -hmm. Marilyn in the middle in this sexy sequ sequined uh, dress that was uh, basically uh, uh, sewed onto her body. It literally was, literally, yeah, backstage, so, yeah. You know, there, th there's the photograph, and I thought, well, who, who's a bigger name than Joe DiMaggio? That's got to be Jack Kennedy. Mm -hmm. So I started looking into him, and what I found out was that, yes, he had a love affair with her. Most people know about that love affair and everything, but I found out then that Joe Kennedy basically 
uh, put the stop to that, saying you're yes. going to run for a re-election in 64. You don't need your name and your photograph out there with Marilyn Monroe. And I thought, well, what about the other guy in that picture, Bobby Kennedy? And that just opened up a whole new world because I started looking into exactly how or why or if, really, Bobby Kennedy had had a love affair with, with uh, uh, Marilyn Monroe. First thing I found out that he was in Los Angeles in, uh, in, in the summer of 1962. He was pitching a book called The Enemy Within, which was all about the gangsters. He made fun of them, their slick back hair and everything. It's no wonder he went after them after he became attorney general, especially the one New Orleans, uh, uh, Don Carlos Marcello, that we can talk about. But he was there. And mm -hmm. so then I got to thinking, well, what, what kind of proof can I find that there's uh, a relationship between them? And what I found was this letter from Gene Kennedy Smith. Let me see if I can uh, find it here. Uh, anyway, while you're looking, uh, real quick, Mark, while you're looking, sure. I just wanted to say in the chat, they're saying wonderful things about this. They're loving this. This is interesting stuff. Uh, Sue has dropped your website here. And if there's any other um, links that you want them to drop, I have fantastic mods and they will drop information so people can go right to it after Correct. the show. And uh, you've got a lot of support in here. Continue well, on. I'm sorry for the interruption. That's good to hear. The The letter from Gene Kennedy Smith basically says, and it's on her stationery, uh, I understand you and Bobby are the new item. When he comes back east, please come with us. And there's an exclamation mark after new item. Please come back with him to the east coast uh, when you when, when you can. Well, that was just that was just huge because it gave me an idea. I mean, Gene Kennedy Smith, for people that don't know, was the sister of both Bobby and 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 JFK. And so, uh, you know, there was no question in my mind that there was a there was a connection there then. And then I came up with this um, CIA document that changed everything. And that basically said that there was proof of a torrid love affair between Bobby Kennedy and JFK, uh, Bobby Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe. Uh, during the summer of 1962. This CIA document was dated uh, just a day or two before Marilyn died as well. Exactly. And the, other, the other thing that it said was, and, and this is the shocker when, when I saw it, uh, it said, and there is evidence that Bobby Kennedy has actually told Marilyn Monroe that he will divorce Ethel Kennedy and marry Marilyn. Yep. And so I got to thinking to myself, well, I've got confirmation now of that love affair. What was going on there? And I started to look in, look more into it because I needed to see what connections I could make with regard to Bobby Kennedy potentially being in Los Angeles on the day that uh, that Marilyn Monroe died. He, he wouldn't have had to have been if he decided to silence her. And before I was able to do that, I found out about a an event, a party that Marilyn was invited to up at a, a, um, a lodge up near the uh, Nevada, California border by Lake Tahoe, mm -hmm. Cal Neva Lodge. Mm -hmm. And Marilyn Monroe was death. There are several accounts, uh, Marilyn Monroe was there. There's several accounts of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Lawford was there. Uh, yep. Frank Sinatra was there. Uh, Buddy Greco, the, the famous dr drummer, was there. And mm -hmm. there's a photograph in the book of Marilyn Monroe with Frank Sinatra. There were mm -hmm. allegations the Kennedys were coming and there was going to be a taping of, ha of her, of Marilyn having sex with them mm -hmm. uh, that somebody could use as blackmail. But no matter what, at some point, and Peter Lawford admitted this, and so did another primary mm -hmm. source witnesses, witness, uh, Marilyn just went freaked out. Yes, screamed. she did. I've had it. I've done with it. I'm tired of, tired of being treated like a piece of meat. And she said the thing that basically led to her death. I'm going to the media about the love affair with the Kennedys. Mm -hmm. So she went back down to Los Angeles. And to confirm that, basically, I found this CIA document, which I'd like to talk about a little bit later with regard to the obsession sure, sure. that JFK, Marilyn and Dorothy shared with, of all things, UFOs. Absolutely. It was in this document, CIA document, which said Marilyn Monroe has threatened to go to the media about her love affairs with the Kennedys. But then the next line was the was the line that really led to her death, as I as I proved in collateral damage. It said uh, the subject, Marilyn Monroe, has also threatened to tell the media about JFK's intention to eliminate Fidel Castro. Well, you can imagine how, how big that was, because what you're what you were talking about 
this is um, this is uh, you know national secrets, the mm-hmm. pillow talk. Yep. Uh, the Kennedys tried to impress her, uh, mm-hmm. all that kind of thing, and that's what they told Marilyn. And so the mm-hmm. moment that she went ahead and said she was going to the media, one thing bad enough would have been her talking about the love affairs. But if yep. she'd have gone to the media and told them about JFK and RFK telling her about these matters of national security, the world that's would it. have blown up. They would have been done. That was it. And so I, I found in that in that uh, CIA document also that you know she had just decided she'd had it with them. So then I looked into, in, in my journey, my research journey, was Bobby Kennedy in LA uh, on, on the day that Marilyn died. And right away I found a stumbling block, as all researchers and historians do, because basically he had an airtight alibi, it seemed, that he was in San Francisco. Uh, there was a friend of his, he was supposedly at his ranch around Gilroy, California, which is south of San Francisco. He was there all day. They they went hiking, the Kennedy family. I have a photograph of him there with the family and all of that. And then I, I found what you, uh, you know, what you uh, exposed there with your introduction, that, uh, that account by Lynn Franklin, who at the time was the most decorated officer in the Beverly Hills Police Department. Um, I got a copy of his book, Beverly Hills Murder File, and I looked in here, and he said exactly what you what you saw on screen there. Hey, guess what? Yep, <laughs> you know, yep. I and that I'll car. tell you something. something. Uh, just to I'll add just, to it, he never I, wavered. Oh no! I've got. I saw so many films of him repeating it, like right after you know, in the black and white, and all the way through his life, he never wavered on what he spoke in the beginning intro. And anybody coming in the chat now, of course, this will play, and you can catch that. But also the stuff that was going on. Well, Mark is talking about it was such a powder keg time. You know, you had the space yeah. race, you had the Bay of Pigs, you had nuclear testing, you had all kinds of stuff going on. And right. here you got the president of the United States. Um, you know, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say it is secret service. Many people have said that they had, they spent more time trying to, to get women in and out before the next one came in or Jackie walked in. Um, yeah. Peter Lawford was married to uh, the Kennedy sister and Peter Lawford I hate to speak ill of the dead, but you are what you are. And he didn't mince words. He was kind of their lapdog. He was there in between, between the Kennedys and Sinatra until the Kennedys blew him off too. And there's no uh, secret about uh, how they blew off Frank Sinatra. They used him. They used the mob to get elected and then they blew everybody off. And they did the same thing with Marilyn. But you have to understand from a woman's perspective, she thought at this time, um, we'll never know what was exactly said between them and what was promised or what you know, she thought, but she was hanging on to this and then to be passed from just passed like a, like, like an old car from John to Bobby. Well, she fell in love with Bobby, Bobby Wooter. There's multiple firsthand account of, of them being together and going to spend a time on the beach, skinny dipping in the ocean from firsthand accounts. And I think Bobby felt a little free too, but somebody snapped him up by his bootstraps. We can only guess who and put the kibosh on that. And that's when they were done. He was done taking her calls. Well, this is, this is that you've just hit the point that I, in the book, I tried to uh, visualize uh, the demeaning type of conduct uh, toward Marilyn, a woman looking for love. She's sitting in her house, which she was so proud of. She just purchased her first house. She had a dog. She was happy. And then these Kennedys, uh, he, she fell into that evil nest. She's sitting by the telephone. She's uh, First of all, when she had, had the relationship with JFK, she's calling the White House. He wants her to call, and they talk. And then they cut off the calls. Then she has this love affair with Robert Kennedy, and I have a ledger uh, where he's at the Beverly Hills Hotel uh, six days before she died. And I want to give you this this other information that confirms Lynn Franklin's account. But uh, she's sitting there, and she's calling Bobby Kennedy. He won't take her her calls. You just have to think about this poor woman crying her eyes out, looking for love. And here's the most powerful uh, man in the world, the president. And, and one of the most powerful female, or most powerful men in the world, they called him the assistant president, Bobby Kennedy. Mm-hmm. And now they're both dumping her. And right. as far as confirming Bobby Kennedy being in L.A., Lynn Franklin is front and center. But I found a ledger over at 20th Century Fox uh, Studios that's in the book. 
Uh, before 11 a.m. on August 4th, 1962, a helicopter landed the 20th Century Fox studio helipad near stage 14. Studio publicist Frank Neal, working that Saturday morning, said he saw Robert Kennedy jump out of a helicopter and rush to a dark gray limousine waiting nearby. <laughs> Neal said he got a glimpse of Peter Lawford, the movie star, brother-in-law to the Kennedys, sitting outside. Now, there, there's, you know, people might say, hey, come on, uh, you know, Lynn Franklin or whatever it is, all these other people have said things. But there's, there's, there's no way they can dispute something like that. So we know he's in L.A. on that day. And then I found a primary witness who said, well, why were they there? They both had to go out to Marilyn Monroe's home and try to talk her out of going to the media. Mm -hmm. And what happened then is that she just absolutely refused. I've had it with you guys. I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the media and all that. They left. And when they did, she was absolutely doomed. Now, I'm not going to give it away in terms of what's in collateral damage, not because I'm trying to be smart about it, but mm -hmm. I want the readers to be able to look at the theories that I have as to how Marilyn Monroe died and how Bobby Kennedy uh, orchestrated that death. And mm -hmm. it's basically uh, based on three or four clues that I found. Uh, one was in the autopsy where there was a fresh bruise on her left hip. And I wondered uh, exactly, you know, how, how that, what that had to do with her mm -hmm. death. Uh, there was no glass in her bedroom that sh uh, she would have used to have taken these 30 to 40 to 50 barbiturates that they said she had taken. Of course, the autopsy was, was completely a, a bogus because Thomas Noguchi, the, the mm -hmm. junior medical examiner, made mistakes, including forgetting, if you can imagine this, to look at mm -hmm. some of Marilyn's organs. But Correct. that was that was a clue for me. Mm -hmm. um, I also uh, Marilyn uh, Dorothy Kilgallen again came to my rescue mm -hmm. because she had written a column about Dorothy about Marilyn's death, and she chronicled all the things that mm -hmm. she wondered about based on email based on mail from readers and things. Why was Marilyn uh, sleeping with the light on? She slept in the dark. Why was she found in the nude? She didn't sleep in the nude. Uh, why was there all these things going on? Uh, with with no glass and so on and so forth. And so that made me really wonder how it could have happened. And that leads me to providing the reader with exactly what I think, think happened with operatives of Bobby Kennedy going to Maryland's uh, home uh, sometime in the late uh, evening of the uh, of the third, the uh, fourth of August, overcoming her and then uh, poisoning her with the barbiturates uh, that ended up causing her death. Now, I can tell you that I, uh, it's amazing to me, and I would encourage your, the people, your audience, of getting in touch with me. Uh, my website, we'll give it to, that to them, email. I answer all the emails from everybody. But just in the last uh, three weeks now, I have gotten two accounts, one from a woman in Boston, outside of Boston, who was a friend of the Kennedy families. They came to a ski resort where she was. And she gave me an account of, uh, of two men who were in her home with her father and what exactly happened to Marilyn on the night she died, which completely parallels exactly what I was able to prove in, uh, in, the, uh, in collateral damage. And the other one has to do with uh, almost the same uh, chronic, uh, chronicling of what happened. It's a little bit different. The one uh, alleges that Bobby Kennedy actually opened a window when he was at Marilyn's home so these intruders could come in. But I found a relative of Joe DiMaggio's where there's, account, there's an account of the fact that uh, her mother, who was also, you know, uh, uh, obviously in, in involved with the DiMaggio family and who became a very good friend of Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn would come to San Francisco. Uh, she loved to be involved with the DiMaggio family. She never had a, a family of her own. And this particular relative of DiMaggio said that her mother was actually on the phone with Marilyn Monroe the night she died and that she heard a Marilyn scream. She heard the intruders. She heard the name of one of them. And then it just went, uh, the, the phone went dead mm -hmm. and it wasn't hung up. And as you remember, they found the phone in Marilyn's uh, one hand uh, because it had not been hung up. So that, that seemed to me very uh, credible in terms of both of those accounts which parallel my own.
And, and it all makes sense because there's no way that Bobby Kennedy could have let Marilyn Monroe go to the media. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in my days as a criminal defense lawyer, um, in my working on all of my investigation for my books and all this, I always look at motive and benefit from the crime. Mm -hmm. And nobody in the entire world, I'm, I'm sorry, not the mafia, not the CIA, not anybody had more of a motive to have silenced Marilyn Monroe than Bobby Kennedy. And did, who benefited from the crime? Well, she was silenced, just like Dorothy Kilgallen was silenced. The same situation. I mean, there's almost 50 similarities in the book between Marilyn and Dorothy. It's incredible. Both of these women mm -hmm. were, were silenced. But, but what happened after uh, Marilyn died? The Kennedy family never uh, said anything about it. They never, they just basically let it go. And the real kicker here, and then I, I want to get your impressions, is uh, I found a book. And I look for these kind of books that nobody ever else ever looks at. It's called The Strange Death of Marilyn Monroe by Frank Capel. And, and what just year a, was that? This the, is 1964. The, there you go. Okay. Two, two years after. Mm -hmm. And um, most people don't even know about the book. I found it through just... Uh, uh, good research, and I think Dorothy may have led me to this particular book, but it chronicles the ruthlessness of Bobby Kennedy uh, with his research and talking to all of these these um, uh, fresh accounts that knew Bobby and knew Marilyn and everything else. It talks about how Marilyn fell into the nest of Bobby Kennedy. It goes on and on with that. But what's most interesting about this is it talks about the love affair and, and all of that was my finding a, a document and, and then an account of saying that when this book was about to be published, the FBI, an FBI document, said that it, they gave this book to Bobby Kennedy for his comments. And the FBI agent who wrote this memo basically came back, came back and said, yes, he has it. And without saying that this is exactly what Bobby said, but apparently a summary of what he said, some of these allegations are true, some of them may not be, and so on and so forth that way. But the reason that I believe what he said in here about Bobby being involved in Marilyn's death is true is the fact that when the book was being published, the FBI and members of the Kennedy family were ordered to go out and buy copies of the book so nobody could read the damn thing. True. Well, that it's means true. That they really felt like that this book was all about the truth. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, otherwise, you know, why would they have even cared? Well, so yeah. there's a whole stream of consciousness here that runs from, from uh, unfortunately, Joe Kennedy, uh, mm -hmm. who wanted to be president and couldn't and wanted to make his, his, uh, his, um, his son's president, all the mm -hmm. way through uh, the 60 election and then to Bobby Kennedy being attorney general and JFK uh, being killed, on to Marilyn Monroe's death, to Dorothy Kilgallen's death. And what I basically say is this. Uh, that if Bobby Kennedy would have been prosecuted for Marilyn Monroe's death in 1962 based on all of the compelling evidence there, and it wouldn't have been covered up by the L.A. police chief, who was a friend of Bobby's, then Bobby Kennedy would have been powerless. He would have had to resign as attorney general. And those people that I believe I've proven in my books who killed JFK, so Bobby would be powerless, those mafioso, especially Marcello, Marcello. they would have have gone after JFK, so there would have been no JFK assassination, and then you stretch that out into the fact there would have been no Dorothy Kilgallen death because there would have been no JFK assassination for her to investigate it. So the three deaths are collateral damage of Bobby Kennedy and Joe Kennedy's abuse of power. It was absolutely some dark dominoes that fell and just one into the next, into the next, oh, into the so next. Excellent. And you absolutely have to, um, again, go back. I love the way, you know, you, of course, you started with other books on many cases. You've been, you know, a, a former defense attorney. You've, you've had so, you know, a consultant on a legal consultant at NBC and ESPN and so many other things. You're not coming out of just some novice corner trying to investigate. Um, I've gotten to know your integrity over the years. I've gotten to know your integrity through your words in the book. Um, and I don't think that you would have gotten so far if you weren't, because this isn't easy to dig into these things. It was so many years ago. I mean, gosh, we're talking what, you know, almost 60 years ago. But people have to understand that when people are in power, um, 
you know, people like Joe Kennedy is raising these children. Um, John wasn't his first choice to be president. He was kind of the uh, consolation card and they try he tried to you know once the uh the first one was killed I forgot his name in uh, Joe Jr. Yes, Joe Jr. John Jr. in uh World War II, you know. Yeah. So he's like, "Okay, now you have to be it." And he was always sickly, always had, you know, a uh, uh, horrible back problems. There's multiple pictures of him in braces and things like that. And I think when he got around these women, um he just did what everybody uh would do in that position, you know. It's like they made made him feel like he really had the power and the admiration and everything else that that he also sought i believe and then you have bobby who is the youngest and never really uh measured up uh, to his father and always and uh, and of course his brother kind of took him under his wing why in the heck uh he turned him uh, on the mob after you know everything that they did to get him elected that was a double cross we discussed that in the other episode greatly and yeah. um you know then not only did he do that he went after them like a pit bull and he got people like marcello and other people in congress and just grilled them in questions and and um it just belittled them and what he can you briefly say what they did to marcello again with the uh, when they deported yeah, well, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I, I appreciate the praise and all of that, but you you have to remember that no other researcher about any of this has had mm -hmm. Dorothy Kilgallen by their side. And yeah. this would have been impossible if, if it hadn't been for Dorothy uh, with her spirit from above. And every time I seem to be, uh, you know, going to quit because I couldn't find something or whatever, it, these things would just fall into my lap out of the sky. I think Dorothy. Yeah, yeah sent them down because, you know, I keep a little saying up here uh, on my wall, the dead cannot cry out for justice. It is the duty of the living the to living. do so for them. Amen. And uh, I'm going to say it also, it seems to like the living can, can use all the help they can get. And so <laughs> I, I, I was able to do that. And I remember specifically, even before I got into writing about Dorothy in The Reporter Who Knew Too Much, uh, that there was something there about the JFK assassination for me to look at it differently than anybody had before. Why wasn't Bobby killed instead of why JFK was? And when Bobby Kennedy became attorney general in A April of 1961, he immediately went after those mobsters, Giancana, Frank Costello, Traficante, but especially Carlos Marcello, whose uh, empire ruled in New Orleans, but also stretched to Dallas. And I've proven that it, 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 it you know, basically there, in fact, I have an eyewitness account now from a woman in Dallas who saw Jack Ruby and, and Carlos Marcello together in the summer of 1962-63 before JFK was died, uh, yes. JFK was killed. But what did Bobby do? Well, he, he basically deported, uh, deported Carlos Marcello who had his empire uh, in Orleans, to Guatemala, to the jungles down there. Uh, he almost died in the jungle, but he got back to the United States, and then Bobby went after him again. He, as of the end of 1963, he was going to go ahead and deport him again, and he had, in a, had him in a New Orleans courtroom charged with racketeering. Well, you can't mess around with those guys. I'll just tell you just a quick story, if you don't mind. No, when, I was a when I was a correspondent for Good Morning America, uh, and I handled, uh, looked at some of their legal cases and also uh, human interest stories and everything. They sent me to uh, Philadelphia to interview the lawyer for Angelo Bruno, who was the Philadelphia Mafia kingpin. And it was about the fact that the Mafia was going to get its fingers into Atlantic City gambling. Well, we were shocked that this lawyer would talk to me because that's not normally something that anybody in the mafia would want. So I went over there, I interviewed this guy, and he told me some things that were pretty shocking. They played that uh, interview the next morning on GMA, and it was a huge success. And so the producer, before I left Philadelphia, said, Mark, do you think he'll talk to you again? So I called the office and this woman answered and I said, this is Mark Shaw, Good Morning America. I'd like to speak to whatever his name was. And there was silence. And I said again, and I heard, I could tell she was crying. And finally I said, are you okay? And she said, well, Mr. Shaw, I guess you don't know. My boss, when he started his car this morning, it blew up. You cannot mess around with those guys. And Bobby Kennedy, he, he, he's told others that there are credible accounts in all of my books 
told others he knew it was uh, uh, Marcelo. He knew that that was the one. He was the one who had the revenge motive to have killed JFK. And so Bobby Kennedy was responsible for his death. And of course, Joe Kennedy, you know, when he found out that JFK had been assassinated, he was sitting in a bed. He'd had a stroke. He had the New York Times in front of him. He threw the newspaper on the floor. And basically, he knew as well that he had been responsible for JFK's death. You, you just can't mess around with those, they, those people. They have their own rules. Absolutely. And you know what? Uh, so did uh, the people in power back then. You know, again, that's why I put a little bit of that clip in there, because y the way everything was set up, um, Peter Lawford did not live far from Maryland's new house. Um, Bing Crosby was uh, right around the corner from there. And that was uh, rumored uh, that that was their first meeting. Uh, JFK and Maryland was there at Bing Crosby's house. I mean, I've read so many things on this. Um, Peter Lawford was like I said, he was like the go between between, you know, Kennedy's would say, I want this set up. Get me that one. I want her there. I want you to set this up over here. The cocktail parties, the subtleties, all that stuff. And all Peter Lawford uh, wanted to was uh, he, there's a quote where he says, all I want to do is just get drunk and cheat on my wife. I mean, that was just the way it was. Um, and around this house, um, that night, there was also uh, some witnesses uh, that speak here and there and say, of course, that they saw things. Uh, there were some people having a poker, I guess, card party or something that saw some things. But the, the number one people that I listened to was... Um, the odd things that Eunice Murray was doing um, and the, the things that she said, she was obviously very scared and overtaken at first. And she had been gotten to, I believe that they were, someone handed her money said, go get lunch when somebody visited that afternoon. Do you want to take us to that? Or do, is that well, where you want to go now or you want to go somewhere no, we else? Can, we can, uh, you know, uh, Eunice Murray is, is a, a very controversial character. She's, yes. She's tough to put a tab on. She's like Lee Harvey Oswald. There, yes. There's all the confusion out there. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was the there was a feeling that she was a plant, that she was put in there as the housekeeper mm -hmm. to, to look after Marilyn. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, there's a couple things about her that are interesting. And I go back to those clues that I will just uh, give uh, share with your audience that have mm -hmm. to do with how Marilyn Monroe uh, died. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, S Sergeant Jack Clemens, who was the first detective on the scene, came there. He was astounded that the death scene had been compromised. Everybody yes. and his brother had walked through that uh, bedroom, but he was really uh, shocked because there was Eunice Murray uh, at the washing machine doing the laundry in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. And so that made him stop and think about exactly what she was washing in that washing machine and all of that. And I cover some of that in the book. Now, then Eunice Murray kind of gave different accounts of, you know, Bobby Kennedy was there, well, he wasn't there, uh, and so on and so forth that way. But mm -hmm. uh, later on, she gave, and, and people can watch it on YouTube and make, I, I like, my books are stop and think books. You can mm -hmm. see what's in there and, and make up your own mind. But um, you can go to the YouTube video on the BBC interview of uh, Eunice Murray. Mm -hmm. And basically, she's almost done with the, uh, with the interview, and then she says, you know, well, you know, I guess I just don't understand why I was supposed to cover up the murder of Marilyn Monroe. Mm -hmm. And so there's obviously that makes you think there's a lot more to what she knew about what was going on that way. But mm -hmm. she and Pat Newcomb, who is uh, Marilyn's uh, publicity woman, mm -hmm. uh, after after Marilyn's death, there's all kinds of, uh, of confusing things that they obviously said and did. I, mm -hmm. I just go back to witnesses that you think you can really trust. Dr. Jack right. Clemens, Lynn Franklin, Clemens. Right. the ledger at 20th Century Fox. Um, all of these, uh, the, the uh, telephone uh, conversation with uh, one of the DiMaggio, with the mother, uh, the DiMaggio account. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. This woman in Boston. None of these people have any reason to lie about what was going on. And Absolutely I think all not. of them are very instrumental in providing us uh, with the truth. I, I do want to say for sure, if I may, that mm -hmm. at the end of this book, and, and I, I hope uh, readers appreciate this, and I've gotten a lot of emails about it, I really try to humanize each of the three subjects of the book, mm -hmm. uh, with each of them saying what we lost and what they lost. Mm -hmm. If you look at JFK, we lost a president of the United States. We don't know what he would have done. Would he have ended right. the Vietnam War? 
We right. do know that he probably would have gone ahead and and this whole man on the moon type of situation would have okay. continued. Uh, uh, his interest in UFOs, uh, civil mm -hmm. rights, all of that. So we yes. lost the, the opportunity to know what he would have done as president. What did he lose? Well, I've got that picture in there that just makes you want to cry of John, John and Caroline in the Oval yes. Office. He never got to play with them as and see what happened to them when they were growing up. Now you go to Dorothy, the mother of three children. She never got to be able to play with them, see how they grew up and all of that. And we lost one of the greatest journalists who ever lived. Who knows what she would have gone ahead. I've just been reading a book about the Lindbergh baby kidnapping case, which has always puzzled, puzzled me. Me too. And she, was right, she was right there in the courtroom mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she wrote about it and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, who knows what else she would have investigated and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then you look at Marilyn always looking for love. All she wanted in her life was to be looked upon as a serious actress and mm -hmm. to have a child. Mm -hmm. She wanted a child so badly because she wanted to mother that child. Just mm -hmm. un unfortunately, she was never mothered when she was a child. Correct. And so she, you know, we, we, she lost that and we lost one of the greatest actresses who ever lived. Uh, mm -hmm. All you have to do is go watch a Marilyn Monroe film and she's the only person on the screen. Nobody else is there. Yeah. And you know, another another aspect of this that's sad, and it's it's really hit me hard, in that account by uh, this, this uh, Ken, uh, DiMaggio relative about her mother, she said that actually Joe Kennedy, uh, excuse me, Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn planned to remarry. And, the, and he had bought her a ring already. They were looking at adopting a child. And it, 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 I just get a little bit of, of a shake yeah. when I think about this. The wedding date would have actually been on the day that Marilyn, Marilyn was buried, oh, man. August 8th. And so, you know, when you look at these three individuals, I hope people will appreciate them for what they were and that those people, other people say to me, hey, Mark, why is this so important? You mentioned it a minute ago, six, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. But if there's any lesson we learn from this, it's the relevance. We have to ask questions. Yes. People just accepted Marilyn Monroe committing suicide, Dorothy mm -hmm. Kilgallen overdosing, JFK supposedly killed by Oswald alone, which the Sixth Floor Museum at Daly Plaza still perpetuates in a ridiculous way. It should we be need shut to ask down. And we need to it ask questions about things going on today. Does Absolutely. anybody really anybody believe, really believe that Jeffrey Epstein committed suicide? No. Come on. No. And yet that case gets closed just as quickly as the ones back in the 60s. Because they keep doing the same playbook. You know, these people that think that they can rule us like puppets and move us around the chessboard, that we're just pawns and that we don't count and that we're expendable and we're not. And neither was Marilyn, neither was Dorothy, you know, um, and Dorothy knew it when she when she saw uh, the situation. I thought that's why I was so sad when I heard what happened to Dorothy and really started looking into that from mm -hmm. you. And, you know, uh, Jim Mars was also one that just he held her in high regard as well mm -hmm. so many people around uh the, the kennedy plot you know i like like you say i hate to say conspiracy because the conspiracy to do harm you know it, it it's it's gotten changed you know so for all the coincidence theorists out there that think that all this stuff is just a coincidence i urge you to think again and look at mark's book and the way he writes it it is a think for yourself book he has links in there he has documents he has this book is just filled with all kinds of documents and pictures and references that you can go back and check yourself and because before this i had known uh somewhat about it and i had been digging through it uh you know through jack uh frank sinatra's eyes you know he had the, the tell-all book and everything else um uh, and started digging back um i never believed uh what happened to Marilyn because you look at the crime scene itself i mean when you break a window from the outside in the glass does not go outside the window you know, it was four hours, I believe, almost four hours, was it not, between the time that supposedly she died and the first uh, police officer that was on scene, which was Officer Clemens, uh, was called. And he said, why did it take four hours? What was the answer? They had to call the studio to get permission before they called an ambulance or a cop. That is absolutely ridiculous. So you've got Eunice Murray there washing something in the washing machine. Clemens is standing there and that psychiatrist creep, 
I forget his last name. I keep putting Reason. him out of my mind. Reason. Thank you. Reason. They're pointing at lined up prescription bottles. And, and Clemens said this himself. He said he just pointed at them and said she must have taken all of these. Now, each one of these bottles are lined up with the cap on tight. Let me tell you something. When you're killing yourself, you're not trying to put those caps back on the bottles and lining them up neatly on a table. And you're certainly not taking them without any water. And that's what Jack Clemens said. He even walked to the bathroom to try to see if maybe she had taken them there. Well, the amount of barbiturates and narcotics that she had in her system, you would have never been able to get it down with mm -hmm. water or no water. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the autopsy, the things that came out too, there would have been a, uh, was it a yellow coating on the pills that would have stained the lining of the stomach? None was found. There were, however, other issues found in other uh, organs. And I believe the organs uh, were actually lost, were they not? Well, they were. If, if you want to really uh, cover up a murder, mm -hmm. just uh, botch the autopsy. Mm -hmm. JFK's uh, autopsy he should have been in, in par at Parkland Hospital. They shipped him off to uh, Washington, D.C. And Dr. Cyril Weck, who's, who's become a good friend of mine, a forensic mm -hmm. scientist, just, I mean, his account of the JFK autopsy in, in the book, he just blasts it. It was so uh, wrong. Also about Marilyn's death, he said, uh, I've conducted uh, 16,000 autopsies, and I've never seen the um, the verdict probable suicide. It's That's either suicide, you know, or it's not. Right. And in that particular case, then Noguchi said, you know, two or three weeks after the autopsy of Marilyn. Um, well, yeah, uh, guys, guess what? Uh, I made some mistakes. I forgot to look at the some interior organs, the intestines, and so on and so forth. And, 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 before, and, and before I could, uh, uh, before I figured it out then, uh, I went to look for them finally and they were missing. Can you imagine the autopsy of one of the most famous people in the world and, and they botched that autopsy. And of course with Dorothy's, you know, I found three bar, I was able to, to prove three barbiturates in her stomach, not one and so on and so forth that way. So that's the easiest way to be able to do that. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that, um, you know, regard to my credentials and all of that, I hope this adds to the credibility. My alma mater, Purdue University, uh, where it took me six years to graduate, uh, <clears throat> to be the uh, archival repository for all of my body of work. Wonderful. And I've sent them everything, my books, research books, all of that kind of uh, material. And and that's the honor of a lifetime, really. Yes. Uh, the, other, the other two, uh, uh, you know, other two, um, uh, you know, uh, collections are Neil Armstrong and and uh, and um, uh, uh, let's see who was the famous uh, aviator um, who died over the ocean. Oh, oh. I died over. Uh, I can't think of her name right uh, now. Anyway. Uh, but, oh gosh! Now that you've <laughs> asked me, it'll pop out. Anyway, oh, pseud pseudonym. Amazing. What's her name? My chat will come up with it in a minute. Okay. Somebody in the chat will give it to us. To me that that's happened. Yes, and, wonderful. And Congratulations. Hope it goes to my credibility because, you know, I want to go ahead and be able to present as many of the facts as I possibly can so that people can make up their own mind as to what's happening. But I think you've done people, it. I think you've done it. These three people did not deserve to die. And I hope Absolutely. maybe on August 4th, uh, people will watch Marilyn Monroe movies or whatever it may be. And if they have any information for me, I'm battling the New York Police Department cold case squad to investigate Dorothy's death. I've sent a letter to the L.A. County D.A. requesting a reinvestigation of Dorothy's of, of Maryland's death. And if you have any tips or you have any, uh, you know, if you want to support that effort, any of that kind of thing, I always welcome that. Absolutely. And we've got all those links in the chat. And it's Amelia Earhart. Thank That's you, Chad. Thank God you so much, you. darling. But uh, thank you, Sherry. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, just the way that night played out, uh, you know, as per the evidence, um, of course, you're going to you're going to hear things uh, out there about the diary. Mark said he's never found any hard evidence about the little red book. Um, you know, I've read some things on Marilyn's house was bugged like crazy. I think probably by about three or four different people, you know, everybody <laughs> saying here, there, the FBI, whoever, all over the place. Um, and they say that those tapes don't exist, but uh, you know, then they admitted they, they were confiscated. So you're going to get a lot of this back and forth, back and forth. And 
the way I would say to do it is look at the look at the people. You know, if you look at Dorothy, you know, Dorothy would have never slept in, a, you know, been uh, sitting in her bed, um, dressed the way she was dressed with a hairpiece and eyelashes and makeup, reading a book without her reading glasses that she had already finished and was telling everybody that she had finished. And people talked amongst themselves back then, hairdressers and things like that. Um, she had said that she was going to blow the case wide open and uh, that, that she also feared for her life and had bought a gun. Um, right. She feared for her children. They they tormented her by putting um, her young son was out trick-or-treating and they put a picture of him on the paper just to torment her and warn her back. But that wasn't Dorothy. Dorothy didn't back down. Dorothy did... Um, investigate and we used to call them you know go gum shoes because you would you, you put it in with your 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 shoe leather and you were you couldn't go on the internet you had to go talk to the people and she put together the truth and they silenced her and she before her death did not believe that marilyn killed herself either you're going to hear that she had tried to commit suicide before well you know what um they say a lot of things. I look at the eyes. I look at the woman. I look at that picture. Um, after uh, she left the set again, uh, started a lot of controversy, uh, supposedly amongst the producers. I heard she had plenty of, uh, look, the president invites you to the birthday party. You're going. And she was going. And I think that night she might have thought that she got to talk to them in person and uh, maybe work some things out. It meant a lot to her. And mm -hmm. at that party, that picture was taken. If you look at her face, that is one angry looking woman. She's just had it, her jaws clenched, and she's just she's angry. And I'll tell you what happens. As a woman, I can tell you this, that first you're disappointed. You're shocked. You go through all of when you're rejected like that, when you're told, when mm. you think you're in love and you think they're in love with you. And then they just slam the door in your face. Not anything, not a goodbye, anything else. You're just rejected. We call it ghosted now. Um, mm. You go through that emotional roller coaster. And um, once you get past that part, you get pissed. <laughs> and she was going to talk. She had, uh, wasn't she going to have that Monday morning, the press conference? She was just going to let it all rip. She, she said she she said she was. Again, I, I have to be careful. You know, there's so many distortions of history about Marilyn out there. For instance, okay. I'll just give you an example. Those bugs. Where, where's the photograph of the bugs? Where are those right. bugs? Right, right. Supposedly they were there and they probably were, but nobody's ever produced them. Nobody's That's ever true. produced any recordings from them and all of that. So I'm very careful about that kind of thing. I really try to lay out, as you know, in my books, mm -hmm. real evidence uh, that like a prosecutor would. Right. And then like let a jury uh, of readers decide what they mm -hmm. think with regard to what happened. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think there's the moment she said that she was going to go to the, the, to the media. Now, whether she would have gone to the media doesn't make any difference. The threat of that whether uh, Dorothy Kilgallen would have actually, in the book she was writing for Random House, named Carlos Marcello as the one who orchestrated JFK's death and J. Edgar Hoover who covered it up. Whether she was going to put that in there or not, it's the threat that, that makes the difference. Yes. Mm -hmm. And those powerful men cannot take a chance that that's going to happen because uh, you know, uh, basically uh, their lives are going to be over, their professional lives for sure. Just think if Marilyn would have gone to the, the media with the love affair with Bobby and JFK. Well, poor Jackie Kennedy. She had to put up with all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, on the other hand, um, as long as, you know, it wasn't in the, it, you know, there wasn't a front page uh, picture of, of Marilyn and, and JFK and uh, any, um, you know, real... Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, details about the love affair or whatever it was, she could probably be okay with that. But if there was, there could have easily been a divorce there somewhere or another if Jackie did, had, had seen that kind of thing. And, and as far as Bobby Kennedy goes, here's Ethel back on the East Coast with all of these kids. And here's Bobby running around with other women as well, but especially uh, now Marilyn Monroe. And, and mm -hmm. you know, that, that's just such an affront to those two women. I have such sympathy for Absolutely. them. Absolutely. But as you say, in those days, some of that was commonplace. But those Kennedys, you know, um, I, I have an account from a, a, a person in, uh, in, in Boston who knew the Kennedys well. And he would tell me how they played by their own rules. Now, this will mm -hmm. seem like a small thing, but Dorothy, uh, Dorothy Kilgallen would have seen it in a lot bigger light. 
He said he would be in a restaurant and the Kennedy clan would come in there, a whole bunch of them. They would go to a table, they'd have a lavish dinner, and they would walk out of there with ev without ever paying the check. Because that's what they thought they could do. Mm -hmm. And all we have to say in that situation with the Kennedys is it all comes around. Look at the tragedies in the, yes. in the Kennedy lives through the year. John Jeff Kennedy Jr. dying. Uh, you know, you go Joe Kennedy Jr. Dying. All of these, these tragedies with wives and nephews and sons and whatever it may be. Hell, it was only, I think, a, a, now a year or so ago when another nephew and a little child died in Chesapeake Day of drowning. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a curse on that Kennedy family. And, and it all does come around based on the conduct you have. That's for sure. Yeah, you can definitely draw that. Um, I wanted to give you something, Mark, because uh, I don't know whether you can see the chat or not. But like I said in the beginning, I have, you know, there's a wide range of listeners. And, and uh, this one particular uncommon belief, I know the age group that that person is in. And it's a, a you know, a younger 20 something, late 20s. And it, what it says is Dorothy Kilgallen was a true journalist who got killed for doing her job and finding the truth. Very sad. Mark, Very sad. Mark really I got to tell you that if, if you set out to tell the world the truth, they're listening. It's yeah. not for naught. I mean, when, when people stop and listen and they're my age group, or yours, we can think about that because we're we're wiser. We've been around and we learn that um, not everything we see, believe half of what you see and, and nothing what you hear, you know, one of those. But when somebody of that age group gets it and understands the kind of person Dorothy was, you have certainly done your job, Mark. And she would well, be so I, proud. I would say to that 20, 21 uh, or 20 -ish person, you are the future. You are the people who have to ask these questions about things that happen, especially when it involves the government and Absolutely. powerful men and all of that. Ask the questions because that's done, not done enough these days. And, and watch the media. And, you know, I, I get these emails from people. Well, Mark, did you check Wikipedia with regard to this? I wouldn't go to that website <laughs> if somebody paid me a million dollars. It used it's to not. be somewhat reliable. But mm -hmm. people go in there now and just write anything they want to yes. and watch in the uh, watch on the Internet. You know, all of the books that, that I used and here's a, a kind of a stack of a bunch of them. But they're mm -hmm. all books written right around the time that all these three deaths happen. Mm -hmm. They're reliable. Mm -hmm. They're in there. The sources are in there who they went to talk to. There's one in here that that I found uh, that was written about Marilyn. And, and he, he talked to more than 100 people who knew Marilyn Monroe. Mm -hmm. and, and really got into her life and times and all that kind of things. Those are the mm -hmm. credible people out there. Those are the people that I respect. So I would just say to that young woman, you know, ask questions, ask questions. Don't accept what, uh, you know, what you're being told by, by those who are trying to cover up the truth. Absolutely. And, you know, I think you've uncovered quite a bit of uh, truth. Now, I know I've kept you over time and I'm sorry. I think we're having so much fun. But uh, we had talked a little bit in the beginning of what uh, Dorothy and Marilyn and JFK and that group were interested in and a little bit about um Dorothy was just, I know from reading on this, that she was so intrigued of, of what you know was going on. And I think that they may have been, again, showing off, but I believe there's some truth in it. What can you tell us about that, Mark? Well, in the CIA document that uh, talks about Marilyn going to the, the media about the love affairs and the, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, matters of national security that she was told, uh, that it was a, uh, a, um, a, a taped conversation between Dorothy Kilgallen and one of her close friends, a man named Howard Rothberg. And basically it talked about the fact that, um, that, uh, that Dorothy had, uh, let's see, Dorothy had secrets to tell, uh, no doubt from, oh, I'm sorry, that Marilyn had, uh, secrets to tell, no doubt from her tryst with the president, the attorney general. She mentioned uh, the president's uh, visit to a secret air base for the purpose of inspecting things from outer space. In the mid-50s, Kilgallen uh, was intrigued by these secrets 
and an effort uh, by U.S. government to identify uh, those uh, the, those um, uh, aliens from uh, from Br British government officials. She believed the story may have come from the late for da 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 and stories. So she talked about that there in terms of the fact that Maryland and JFK Maryland had been told by JFK that he was going to go ahead and uh, look into uh, the UFOs. So I found uh, two uh, CIA, uh, two FBI documents. One of them is very intriguing because it's kind of burned. It it looks like that somebody tried to destroy it. And the other one is, um, I'll just I'll hold it up for you. You can see, it looks like it was uh, somebody tried to get rid of it. And it's a CIA document. This is a CIA document, I'm sorry, not FBI. And basically, as you can see, it looks like it's been, uh, somebody's been trying to, to burn it. And basically, wow. it talks about the fact that um, Lancer, which was JFK's uh, nickname that the Secret mm -hmm. Service used, uh, that he is uh, making inquiries regarding our activities and the CIA looking into uh, the possibility of um, people from outer, outer space uh, actually being around. And then there's another document, November 12, 1963, uh, that has uh, basically JFK's signature on it, talking mm -hmm. about that he would develop a program. Uh, it would be very helpful if you would have uh, high throat cases reviewed with the purpose of identified identification of possible bona fide um, people from outer space. I would like to approach a range of program of data sharing with NASA where unknowns in capital letters are a factor and so on and so forth. And so it, it just was amazing to me. And then Dorothy had actually written a column about little green men uh -huh. when she went to a UFO convention in Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And that particular column, which I have in the book, really talks about her belief that she talked to scientists and everything else, that uh, she was a believer as well. Yeah. So I, 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 a lot of readers have, have found it amazing that mm -hmm. another similarity between Marilyn, JFK, and, and Dorothy was their obsession with JFK. And in this one document that I found too, it talks about that JFK doesn't want the public at all to know that he gives any credibility to the possibility mm -hmm. of UFOs. And we can understand why that would be because if it got in the newspaper or whatever, maybe you know back then a lot of people thought you were crazy if you right. believed that was the case. So Absolutely. that's another uh, interesting aspect of the new information that I have in the book. Isn't that amazing? Well, Mark, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you giving all this time. I don't know what you're going to do next. What are you going to do next? <laughs> Who's next, Mark? Because <laughs> you said well, you I, weren't going to write the last three. <laughs> my, my, my quest now really is to try to get justice for, for Marilyn and Dorothy. Absolutely. And uh, I'm hoping to get support with the L.A. County D.A. I sent him a... Uh, a letter, the book, and 350-page evidence document showing, come on now, you know, a reinvestigation. Uh, uh, Maryland's reputation was ruined back then. Have the decency to go ahead and look into this. And the same thing with the NYPD cold case squad with regard to Dorothy Kilgallen. So those are my objectives right now. And and if I have any success in that area, I'll certainly come back to you because uh, you've been such a wonderful uh, friend and, and such a good interviewer and you're always uh, prepared. And, and, I, and I will, again, thank you because you were the main one who kind of gave me a nudge towards looking into Marilyn Monroe's death as well. Maybe we can get some justice for that lady because I've, uh, like I said, um, I can understand. I have a lot of sisters, you know, and again, they were all older than me, and uh, I wound up being basically an orphan at twelve. And oh. I understand what it's not, what it's like to never belong in a spot. And she wrote, um, I wouldn't say it was a poem; it was more just like a, a just her thoughts out at this one point where she was saying, you know, I, I that she imagined that it would be the best thing to be really loved. And I think she had one disappointment after another, not only in her mother leaving her, which she remembered, she was old enough to remember being left. She was old enough to remember looking out the window and hoping that one day she would be, um, you know, in a different place and held up, you know, higher as a, a, a model or a star or whatever. Um, very young, she started the modeling. And I think she made like $50 for the whole shoot. And that's 
when she was in, uh, you know, she was still Norma. And um, she found that she could get those things um, sure. by, by, you know, being who she was. And that's really no different than a lot of people. You know, don't look at her and, you know, that she cheapened herself or anything else. You know, life tried to cheapen her and she never gave up the fight to show how valuable and wonderful she was and how much she had to give. She never stopped trying to learn. She always had a, a, a coach, an acting coach around her trying to give a better performance. You'll hear some people t saying, well, she had to do too many takes and she did this and she, you know. That's people that didn't understand. She was trying to put onto that camera what uh, she really had to offer. And every person that came along, um, even Joe DiMaggio was a little of a disappointment because he had a hard time being the Italian raised he was, uh, putting up with, you know, everybody being Mr. Monroe, uh, yeah. really. I mean, quite honestly. And he got a little uh, jealous. I, I think uh, the whole skirt thing in New York was right. like the, like the cut off there and um that was it but she she didn't give it up because she said she thought it really portrayed the character well and um and that was it uh very much like frank sinatra and mia farrow you do that movie we're divorced and that's what the guys did back then you know you listen to me or an ultimatum and if you were a woman that stood up to that ultimatum you know it showed a lot of courage back then it was a different time and both of these women had a lot of courage to stand up and tell the truth. And I'm so glad, Mark, you're out there with the courage of uh, being propelled forward to fight for both of them. Thank you. Well, I'd like to speak to that 20, 20 year old again, if I may, because Absolutely. these are two inspiring women. Mm -hmm. You know, back in their day in the early 60s, and unfortunately, there's a lot of that still infecting today but women were it was supposed to not be in the back seat of a car they were supposed to be in the car behind they yes. were second class citizens dorothy had to work her way up with gender discrimination when she began as a uh, cub reporter at the new york journal american and you know they wouldn't give her uh, big stories they wouldn't let her do much and then all at once just through tenacious hard work and all of that they began to respect her and she became what the New York Post called the most powerful female voice in America. Look at Marilyn, okay? Mm -hmm. Marilyn had to go through that awful gambit of, of everything in the entertainment industry, of mm -hmm. producers coming after her and only wanting one thing. If you'll yep. go to bed with me, and, and I have some of that in the book with what mm -hmm. she had to go through, then you'll go to mm -hmm. bed with me. Sure, I'll put you in the next movie and all of that. Mm -hmm. She had to put up with all of that, that demean. Talk about the Me Too situation. Yeah. I mean, it was just worse back then or as bad as it is today. And I think mm -hmm. it's still going on that way. So they're both real inspirations. But I'd like to leave you with just one story about Marilyn since her, her anniversary is next uh, on the 4th. Uh, it's amazing to me where my research comes from. And actually, this particular man, Bob Levitt, came to me because he had read uh, The Reporter Who Knew Too Much about Dorothy Kilgallen. Mm -hmm. And he knew the Kilgallen family when he lived in uh, New York City. He was Ethel Merman's son. Now, many of your uh, audience may not remember Ethel Merman. They're too young to do so. But she was a huge Broadway yeah. star. Mm -hmm. And she was, in, um, she was in There's No Business Like Show Business with yes. Marilyn Monroe. But Bob Levitt told me some stories about Dorothy Kilgallen and her family and the kids. They played together, all of that. At one point, uh, to show how big uh, Dorothy's uh, radio show was, uh, Bob Levitt's, uh, Ethel Merman's um, little um, bird, uh, little uh, parakeet, flew out mm -hmm. the window of their apartment. And who went? Who knows where it went? Right. So. Ethel Merman and uh, the husband called Dorothy's home and said, could you put this uh, out on your radio show? Mm -hmm. that our parakeet <laughs> is missing. And you know what? Somebody yeah. called in and said that parakeet's on our window. So that's Aww. Dorothy. Now with mm -hmm. Marilyn, Bob Levitt told me this story. He went with uh, Ethel Merman to the, to the set of there's no business like show business. Mm -hmm. And there was Marilyn. And he was about nine or 10 years old. It's in the book. Uh, and, and she just sat with him and they started talking. And he was just amazed that this, the greatest actress in the world was even talking to him. 
and they talked about different things. And then uh, Ethel Merman had gotten a play sword from a movie being next uh, being made next door, Prince Valiant or something like that, yeah. I believe, and gave it to uh, to Bob, uh, young Bob. And Marilyn just loved that sword, and they played with it and everything else like that, and kind of played, you know, with with uh, moving the sword back and forth between them. And, and it's just like she was a little kid, see? And she loved kids so much. And you know what he said? He said, of all the, the, the people I met with my mother in show business, and, and you can imagine how many he would have met through his mother being Ethel Merman. She was the kindest, most loving woman uh, actress I ever knew. Mm -hmm. And it really made me upset when I went back to the, the, the dressing room with my mother and these other actresses would talk about Marilyn behind her back and say yep. bad things about her. Mm -hmm. See, this was the Marilyn, the loving, caring Marilyn mm -hmm. who died yep. almost 60 years ago. Yep, almost. And was, for anybody who wants to see uh, emotion and uh, what the, she was longing for, there's some outtakes from Something's Got to Give um, mm -hmm. that where she was practicing on seeing the, the, the basic story is she was shipwrecked or something on an island and then came back like five years later. And her, her husband who was played by Dean Martin was uh, fixing to get married again. So she's seeing her children after five years of not being near them and the, the, the longing and the facial expressions and her eyes and the way she moved to try to get that look. I think that she had been feeling that all her life. She mm -hmm. wanted to be loved, but more than wanting to be loved and accepted for who she was, she wanted to love. Mm -hmm. And um, I think she put her love in a lot of the wrong places. I mean, gosh, we all, we all have stories, but one after the other were, was putting on their best foot forward. And when she found Found out who they really are uh, were she was so disappointed um i think you know arthur miller disappointed her um just the way you know when he left his diary or journal open it said he was disappointed in marilyn uh, that did it she shut off you know uh and and, and it just broke her down um uh, and, and different things like that so she was always seeking that approval not just from people around her and friends but from the audience as well so to do marilyn like like mark says uh some justice go watch the misfits um understand that clark gable uh died soon after that and so did um the other gentleman that was in it not long after but that was written by arthur miller for with her in mind for that part but she gave everything she had in that and mm -hmm. i you know when she's trying to wrestle that horse away from clark gable uh, yes. and, and and she she had everything in that and um i think she struggled for her her life that way and i would like her remembered um mark i have a little something for you from uh, another uh listener here and again uh 20 something realm so look at the impact we can't forget our history and how long they have been doing all these cover-ups we need to remember all the ones who died to better our future yeah, and i can tell you right yeah. now dorothy was one of them and yeah. if dorothy wanted marilyn looked into by gosh we did it and uh mark i think you've knocked this one out of the park all your books um are fabulous and um very in-depth i have researchers in here that i lean on all the time pseudonym is one of them and said you're one of the best researchers your your research is amazing and if she is saying that that is something my friend That's so i i cannot thank you enough please tell us you have a dorothy kilgallen site Please tell us all of your where we can find you, where we can get the book. Um, tell us where. Well, uh, the Dorothy the Dorothy Kilgallen Story org is all about Dorothy. Her photographs, columns, interviews with people who knew her, interviews with with her, all of that. Uh, I've tried to put a compendium up there of of all the all everything Dorothy. So that's the best place. My website is markshawbooks.com. And you can read my letter to the LADA uh, about a Maryland uh, investigation of her death. All of that is up there. And then my email is mshawin at yahoo, M-S-H-A-W-I-N at yahoo. And I answer every single email that I get. So that's the way to get in touch with me. 
regarding the book and, and purchasing it, I send people, if I if I may, to independent bookstores. They're still having a very difficult time staying alive. Barnes and Noble yes. is as well. Of course, it's up on Amazon, but if you can, uh, order it on uh, order it from one of the bookstores, the independent bookstores. They're dropping all your links in the chat, Mark. Uh, they're taking good care of you today, and they're listening and uh, they're learning. And you know, I again, I. I think that uh, I've watched uh, a lot of the What's My Line um, oh, yeah. with Dorothy. I'd like to leave the listeners with a little bit of that was uh, Dorothy was so good at this. They say that she used to get crazy uh, at when you watched um, Ironsides and, you know, like Perry Mason. OK, uh, oh, because yeah, she, yeah, because she was that on it all the yeah. time. And I know my mom was the same way. And that taught me uh -huh. how to be, uh, you know, inquisitive and look into sure. things and dig a little deeper. Um, I wish you all the best uh, going after this. Um, you know, if, if I don't, I don't think Dorothy's done, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm open to it. I'm always listening because, uh, you know, I have such respect for her, respect for Marilyn too. And, and uh, they've become kind of a part, so much part of my life. You know, I love them both. Yes. And, and because of you, it's be, she, they've become a part of our lives, too. And we're going to look into this even more. If if there's anything we can do, if you want us to write letters, you know, uh, to try to prompt that along, you just let us know. Um, yeah. and, and please, and you're welcome to come back anytime and uh, let us know your progress because you are absolutely a dear friend of this show. And I can't thank you enough for giving up some of your Sunday to share with us today. Happy to do so. And thank you to, and your audience as well. It's been a pleasure to be on the show again. Thank you so much, Mark. We're going to let you go. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and keep in contact with us. I will, thank you sure. listeners. Thank you so, so much. Good, Good night. Good night.